All right, today we're going over the perfect leg workout and why the science around how you should be training them is false. And at the end, I'll build out a workout that will ruin your life. So if you're ready, let's get after it. All right, let's start out by electrocuting all four quad muscles at the same time. And I'm sterile. There's a lot of videos out there that go over the scientific way to train your legs for hypertrophy. And most of them are short-sighted. The other ones are outdated and need to be updated. And there's some that are interesting, but need a little more context. Let's start with quads. I'm sure you've heard somebody say it's impossible to train your inner or your outer quadricep muscles. And their argument absolutely makes sense because if you look at the innermost muscle of your quad, your vastus medialis, your teardrop, or your outermost muscle, your vastus lateralis, or your sweep, neither of which connect to your hip. They connect somewhere underneath all this shit high up on your femur. So no matter what you do, externally or internally rotate your hips, feet wide, feet close, doesn't matter. Neither muscle is going to get lengthened or shortened because they originate at virtually the same spot on opposite sides. It's all here. Black and white. Clear as crystal. You get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. But I have a huge problem with that because even though that makes sense, that's not been my experience. In the past, I've had clients come in with a non-existent medialis and by manipulating their form as we train legs, I was able to turn that dilapidated nutsack into one of the most dominant muscles to the point it looked like there was some sort of growth growing out of their knee. And others who came in with no quad sweep, we just modified the movements, and in no time, they got out of those skinny jeans. And even calling out my own experience, I know I can instantly put more emphasis on either one of those muscles and get a better connection, create a more intense contraction. The next day, that muscle is gonna be the most sore, and most importantly, it makes progress. But I also thought, I have no idea how to figure out why that is or how to explain it to people. And the last thing I want to do is get in a fight with a biology major who daydreams about being muscular as they shadow box in the corner of the gym. Maybe I should just shut up. And but then I did some digging and found that there is science that supports the fact that you can selectively target your inner or outermost quad muscle. To help me explain this, I want you to first think about your tits. The reason you can't neglect incline movements in your training isn't simply because that upper chest has its own distinct head, but more importantly, it's because those chest fibers have a completely different orientation. If the heads of your pec could work individually, they'd actually be antagonists. That clavicular head would cause your arm to raise, and that sternocostal head would force that arm back down. But that's not how they work. They work in unison because that's how tip muscles work. The same exact principle applies to your medialis and lateralis. They both work to stabilize your knee by pulling in opposite directions, but I'd argue that you can selectively isolate either one of these at will, and I can prove it by electrocuting myself. Now I'm doing this on the leg extension to help illustrate my point, but you're not gonna to wanna to internally or externally rotate your knee or hip when you're doing this exercise because it's gonna cause a shearing force on your knee that's not what you want. I mean, I've done it, but I'm an asshole, so whatever. At the end of this video, I'll show you how to apply this principle to every single quad exercise we do. All right, let's start out by electrocuting all four quad muscles at the same time. As you can see, there's an equal distribution of current and contraction throughout the muscles, but the moment I start to externally rotate my hip and open up that knee, keep my hand in the same exact position, the fibers of that vastus medialis are now even more engaged. The same thing happens when I go the other way and I internally rotate, now the lateralis is more engaged. And before you say, yeah, dickhead, it's because you're inhibiting that muscle's ability to contract by pressing it against the pad, that isn't it. It has everything to do with what we talked about earlier, and that's that muscle fibers are laid out in a very specific way, and that's the exact way they contract. So at all times, they're fighting to put themselves in the optimal position to generate force. Because even when I take the load off my leg and externally rotate my hip to try to limit the lateralis's ability to work, the moment I apply current and electrocute the shit out of myself, it auto-corrects and forces me in a position where the fibers of that lateralis can dominate knee extension. And the same exact thing goes for the medialis, but it fucking hurt more. And if you're sitting there thinking, what the hell does electrocuting yourself have to do with science? Here's an interesting study I found that Brad Schoenfeld did. Look at the differences in hypertrophy when comparing full and partial range of motion. When they strapped somebody up to an EMG and had them do leg extensions with no tweaks to their form, they found that certain muscles in the quads were more active during different portions of the movement. For instance, the vastus lateralis was more active during the middle portion, and the vastus medialis was more active during lockout. And I think we've all unknowingly experienced this. You go to a different gym, hop in their leg extension, and think, this thing fucking sucks. The range of motion is too short. This is going to be a waste of a workout. And then two sets in, you're walking around like you got 10-pound nuts because your teardrops are blown out. Now, what about hamstrings? I highly doubt any of you have looked into the science behind training them and your only experiences with your elementary school PE teacher who hovered over you with those broad shoulders and her short ass haircut 
threatening to take away your popsicle that you rightly earned for running the mile so fast you lapped the kid whose parents obviously gave up on him because he wore jeans every day because you couldn't flex your toes to your shins when you did your hamstring stretch. Another interesting study I found showed that having your toes pointing towards your shins and dorsiflexion when you're doing leg curl movements will allow you to generate more force. And I don't think this is why most people do them this way. I think it's more of an unconscious thing. But regardless, this is where I go completely rogue because I think you should do the exact opposite. And this is something I figured out years ago by putting a moderate amount of weight on a leg curl machine and doing a couple reps with my feet in a neutral position. And then without resting, went right into plantar flexion, so toes pointed away and it was fucking impossible. Got my ass kicked. So I went right to dorsiflexion and it was too damn easy. Now, why is that? It has everything to do with your gastrocnemius. Its main action is plantar flexion of the foot, but because it crosses the knee joint, it also aids in knee flexion. Now, what you're doing when you're putting your feet into plantar flexion during a leg curl is flexing your calf and actually isolating the movement even more down to your hamstrings, which sounds counterintuitive, but what you're doing is essentially turning your calf into the assistant to the regional manager giving it a meaningless job of contracting that calf so it can't help in with knee flexion, but when you're in dorsiflexion, it can multitask and screw up everything. Also remember, when it comes to hypertrophy, strength or how much force you can generate isn't the name of the game. If that's your goal, then you should be trying to recruit as many muscles to work as efficiently as possible to move the most amount of weight. That's the antithesis of hypertrophy, where you're basing everything you do off connection and isolation. You're trying to limit secondary involvement as much as what's biomechanically possible to just hit that targeted muscle. But if you're still a little worried about doing it that way, just turn every leg curl movement you do into a mechanical drop. Start in plantar flexion. When you get your ass kicked, go right into dorsiflexion. One more interesting thing I found, which I've always felt to be true, was a study done on the effectiveness of hip hinge movements versus knee flexion movements. And when comparing stiff leg deadlifts to leg curls, leg curls were far more effective at eliciting growth. It should just serve as a good reminder when you're stuck somewhere with limited hamstring equipment, even though it's a pain in the ass and there's a 50-50 chance you're gonna drop that dumbbell on your lopsided balls, you should still do dumbbell leg curls. If you've ever done any research on glute training, then at some point you came across Brett Contreras. And the only thing I'll say about him is, he used to teach math in my high school, which is fucking weird because he was like two years older than us. I remember one of my friends turning to me saying, I don't think this guy should be teaching us math. And I looked at him in a very disappointed face. What was the giveaway? The beer bong in the back of his truck? This guy looks like he should be working at a Margaritaville, constantly getting written up for getting chest hair in people's drinks, or in a lab, researching women's butt cheeks. I was right. The glute science lines up with what I've felt for years. Anytime you can exaggerate the stretch, do it because you'll get even more glute activation. That's why every time I do sumos, I turn them into more of a hip dominated movement. And when I do something like reverse lunges, I actually rather do them assisted and hold on to something. That way I can shift my husky body over top of my glute and then exaggerate the stretch by leaning more forward. Now, when it comes to calf training, I've heard people say for years that foot placement doesn't matter, but it absolutely does. And there's a few studies that are starting to show that, but you have to look a little bit deeper than the general conclusions. Like this one, like, who the fuck talks like this? Like this one, they concluded that pointing your foot forward may be the ideal approach when the aim is to induce proportional improvement across both heads of the gastrocnemius. That's fucking right. How much further do you have to read to get to the part that I actually believe? The very next fucking line. It says that pointing your foot outward or inward may induce selective growth. That should be your aha moment. Anytime you can selectively isolate a region and cause targeted damage and stress, you're gonna get more growth. Here's a better way to illustrate my point. The next time you go to shit in a paper bag and light on somebody's doorstep, what do you think would be more effective? Dropping a Hershey's kiss into a bag for each one of your neighbors or picking one of your neighbors to victimize, soaking that bag in gasoline and eating Chinese food for three days? Choice is yours. Now this is an incredibly important thing to point out. What you do with your foot is even more crucial than how you place your feet because I can put my foot in a neutral position and as I contract up, if I supinate my foot, I'm gonna put more pressure on those medial fibers. If I pronate my foot, there's gonna be more pressure on those lateral fibers, that outer head of your gastroc. The way you place your feet just makes it easier to do that. All right, let's put together everything we learned into one hell of a workout. Starting off with quads. Now that we absolutely know you can target your sweep or your teardrop, just look down and see what's more embarrassing. If it's your sweep, then put that lateralis in prime position to bear the load, not by internally rotating your knee, you'll die, but by doing movements that allow your leg to be closer to your midline. A good starting exercise would be a leg press with your feet together and then right into a split squat with your working leg directly in the center of you. If your teardrop is more like a ball sack on a hot summer day, then choose a movement that allow it to dominate, like a hack squat where your feet are still close, but your toes are out at 45 degrees. And based upon what we learned, pre-exhausting on the leg extension, but staying at the top for a partial movement and forcing that lockout, 
is the way to go. Then go throw up on hack squat. And for hamstrings, it's still incredibly important to incorporate some sort of hip hinge movement because they target a different part of the muscle. Stiff legs are usually a good way to go, but make sure you do some sort of leg curl movement because they work better. Standing, lying, doesn't matter. And if you wanna get even more of it, isolate that hamstring even more, point those toes away, plantar flexion, and when you get your ass kicked, go to dorsiflexion. Glutes for me, tough to beat sumos, especially when you're hinging at the hips, but the research shows you get even more activation out of step up. So to make it even worse, when you go into that negative, I would get assistance by holding onto something and really leaning forward to exaggerate that stretch even more. And finally, calves respond to a pretty good ass kicking. So hit them from all three angles, medial head dominant, lateral head dominant, and then fuck them both. And I'll make sure to leave the sets and reps in the description, but make sure you don't do this workout over and over again. And that's all you do, because based upon the research of Jose Antonio, Different exercises induce hypertrophy in different regions of the muscle. So after you do this leg workout, make sure you watch this video and do this leg workout next. And if you have 419 pesos, buy one of my programs. I'll link them below. Most importantly, make sure you subscribe because the next video is gonna be a good one.